This episode of the Skeptic Zone podcast is dedicated to the memory of Dr. Siobhan O'Sullivan. Welcome to the Skeptic Zone, the podcast from Australia for science and reason. Yes, it's the Skeptic Zone podcast, episode number 767, for the 18th of June, 2023. Richard Saunders coming to you from Sydney, Australia. And yes, I'm very sad to report that my friend, Dr. Siobhan O'Sullivan, whose journey, if we might use that word, uh, with her ovarian cancer has been documented here on the Skeptic Zone over the past three years. But of course, sadly, and Siobhan knew this would happen, in the last few days, she did pass away. I'll be speaking more about Siobhan and what she meant to the Skeptic Zone and her message coming up at the top of the show. Also on today's show, Susan Gerbeck returns with the story of the TikTok quack and Wikipedia and how important her work in Wikipedia really is when it comes to putting out good information also, we have the Australian Skeptics Newsletter, read by Adrian Hill in Canada. And also on today's show, the Trove segment looks at water divining. An oldie but a goodie. And I just heard on the news report this morning that a major cold snap is heading for the southern parts of Australia. So to all my friends in that neck of the woods, Victoria and Melbourne, and you know who you are, I hope you can keep warm. But now it's time for me to run downstairs, have a nice, strong cup of coffee, and I'll return in a moment with a tribute to Dr. Siobhan O'Sullivan. Dr. Siobhan O'Sullivan died only a few days ago at the very young age of 49 from ovarian cancer. I first met Dr. Siobhan when Maynard and I attended the first meetup of the Sydney Podcasters Group way back in 2015, and uh, we hit it off straight away. Dr. Siobhan had a PhD in political science, but her main focus in life was animal welfare, the respectable treatment of animals. And she had a podcast, Knowing Animals, which dealt with that subject. In the early days, I interviewed Dr. Siobhan about her podcasting and her interest in animal welfare. But it wasn't until 2020 that things made a dramatic change in her life when she was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. And Siobhan was under no illusions. She knew she had a terminal condition. The only question was, for how long could her life be extended? And she was also under no illusions about medical care. She knew full well that the best option for her was scientifically based, evidence-based medicine. She, as you can imagine, as many people in her situation, she received lots of probably well-meaning advice from people suggesting that she should take all sorts of alternative therapies. She rejected that and stuck with what she knew was her best hope. Siobhan's optimism, courage, and always looking on the, the sunny side of life, always, really struck me. Siobhan's sense of humor shone through like never before when, in 2021, she contacted me and suggested that we go on a ghost hunt in her local area to find somewhere where she could haunt after she died. An offer too good to pass up, Maynard and I accompanied Siobhan on the ghost tour, and that made for an episode of the Skeptic Zone podcast, and I will link to that episode, which is on YouTube as well, the extended version, in this week's show notes. But here are some clips from that very adventure. Now, as we're strolling along, Siobhan, uh, Skeptic Zone listeners will remember I interviewed you, was it April or something like that? May or something like that? Now, you have been undergoing quite uh, the adventure, 
mm. quite the adventure. Just for the sake of our listeners who may not have heard that episode, uh, you were a podcaster doing Knowing Animals, and then you received the news that you were diagnosed with ovarian cancer. Yes, that's right. In start of August 2020 last year, I was feeling quite bloated and a bit unwell. I couldn't really put my finger on what it was. I ended up in the emergency room at RPA, which is one of the big public hospitals in Sydney, and I was told that I had ovarian cancer, stage 3. Since then, I have gone through the standard procedure, the standard treatment, which is six rounds of chemotherapy and surgery to remove the cancer. But I've been very unlucky. I, um, the cancer had already spread, basically, before they stopped the primary treatment. And then I was moved on to another chemo. But then after a couple of rounds, I was chemo-resistant, meaning that chemotherapy couldn't work for me anymore. So this is what happens, unfortunately, with ovarian cancer. You know, I was about 20 years younger than the average age of diagnosis. And within kind of eight months, I was basically terminally ill. And so I was given a couple of options. One was to stop all treatment and I would die by Christmas this year, so in a month. Or I could go back to a really old chemotherapy drug and I would lose all my hair, I'd have to have it once a week, I'd be constantly sick and I'd live a year. Or I could look around for a drug trial. Mm -hmm. So with options like that, I decided to look around for a drug trial. (laughs) So thankfully I am on that drug trial. I have had one round and so far it has shown that the tumours aren't growing so I stay on it until the tumours start growing and then I'm out of treatment options so I'm hoping to live another year and a half, that's what I would like at least Um, I've been told to look around for another drug trial but finding another ovarian cancer drug trial is not as easy as it sounds so that's my situation and one of the things I want to do is, is raise awareness about ovarian cancer because it is this really anomalous cancer it is not like so many other cancers where it can be quite effectively treated and a large majority of people would be expected to live for quite a while if not have remission ovarian cancer has something like a 25 percent you know survival rate and it is a really it's a real killer and we need research is that reason because it's usually discovered late because it isn't found early it is a real creeper so you get almost no symptoms you get this feeling that you're a little bit bloated but quite frankly during COVID who doesn't feel quite a bit bloated Mm. and of course um, for many women most women they get it later in life and so you will have skipped periods and things like that but that's also part of getting older so a lot of people just think my body's changing with age but in fact it may well be ovarian cancer. Exactly. I have asked my friends and family to really think about avoiding the vocabulary of battle, particularly when I die, which is what is going to happen to me fairly soon. And the reason why I don't appreciate that use of language is it suggests that I have agency and if only I fought harder, did this, did that, then it would go away. And the extension of that is that I brought this on myself with the wrong type of thinking or whatever else. And not only do I think that is incorrect... But also it means that all the little children that get cancer, they also had the wrong type of thoughts. They didn't think in the right ways. And I think that is so nasty and so unhelpful. So I've asked my treating doctors numerous times over, what can I do to help myself? And they say the same thing over and over again. Stay away from sick people because I'm immunocompromised and turn up for your appointments because the doctors are the ones that are going to keep me alive. Well, look, I have decided that one of the things I want to do before I die is raise awareness and funds for ovarian cancer treatment. So it really is one of the most deadly cancers you can get, definitely most deadly cancer for women, and that has to change. It's too late for me. I'm going to die of ovarian cancer. That's what's going to happen. But there are young women out there who do not have to suffer that same fate. We need research, and research requires funds. So I'm doing as much as I can whenever I'm getting an opportunity to do it. So it's various things. So for me to give myself meaning in this last period of my life is to try and make the world a better place for women with ovarian cancer. I saw Dr. Siobhan 
twice in the last week of her life and uh, a couple of very short visits to her bedside at the palliative care ward at Concord Hospital. On the first occasion, I, I actually got a, a very nice laugh from Siobhan when I told her that I'd turned up to haunt her before she had a chance to haunt me. On the second occasion with Maynard, we uh, reminded Siobhan that her work in her own podcast and maybe on The Skeptic Zone, would live on for a long time after she left. Despite being very ill and finding it very difficult to speak, Siobhan let us know that it was uh, very nice that we came to visit her, and she reminded us that a couple of years ago she gifted us some popping filters for recording, since she knew she wouldn't need them anymore, one for me and one for Maynard, which I use every time I record the Skeptic Zone podcast, and I'm using it right now. The Skeptic Zone podcast extends our deepest sympathies to the family and friends of Dr. Siobhan O'Sullivan, and the tributes are pouring in for her on her Facebook page, even as I speak. Siobhan, Bonnie, you will be sorely missed. think we need to think. Here's Susan Gerbic. Hello, Skeptic Zone listeners. This is Susan Gerbic from the Gorilla Skepticism on Wikipedia Project. I have something really interesting to tell you today, and I hope you guys enjoy this. This is pure activism and pure just joy to be able to explain this scenario to you. Back in 2019, Richard Saunders on the Skeptic Zone and other Australian skeptics were writing a lot about a woman from Australia who is a naturopath. Her name is Barbara O'Neill, and her last name is spelled O apostrophe N E I L L. What I was hearing on the skeptic zone sparked my interest. Now, not everybody can have a Wikipedia page, it takes a threshold of notability, could be considered a bit extreme in some cases. It's not just fame. It's not popularity, but there has to be enough notable sources printed in notable places or written by notable people. That's a little confusing, but for the moment, just go with it. It was a point where Barbara O'Neill, because of the work of the Australian skeptics and other agencies in Australia, enough information was out there that I was able to ask my secret cabal if they would be interested in writing a Wikipedia page for Barbara O'Neill. And two of my editors, one in English and one in Spanish, took on the task, and they created a Wikipedia page for this woman. Now, she, outside of Australia, she had very little fame. Let me read the beginning of the Wikipedia page to you. Barbara O'Neill is an Australian naturopath and lecturer on health issues who in 2019 was banned for life by the New South Wales Healthcare Complaints Commission from providing free or paid health services. The ban followed an investigation which found she lacked any health-related qualifications, a degree, diploma, or membership in an accredited health organization. It also found that she provided dangerous, unsupported health advice to vulnerable groups. This included advising parents to feed their babies raw goat milk, or almond milk blended with dates or banana instead of formula, and recommending that cancer patients forego chemotherapy in favor of baking soda wraps and dietary changes. Yeah, a real winner. You guys are all cringing right now, as I am as well. 
So we created this Wikipedia page in 2019 in English and in Spanish. And it tootled along with very few views, maybe 20 views, 30 views a day, which is really small. Back in July of 2022, her Wikipedia page views started to hit about 500 views a day for a very short amount of time. And then they went back down into the 50s a day or so. And then about February of 2023, we noticed that her Wikipedia page views were spiking, sometimes over a thousand page views a day. And we couldn't quite figure out what was going on. We reached out to Richard Saunders, who told me that there's been more written about her lately, and she has taken to TikTok, and she's been putting out short videos, which are really bad. Then we start seeing her spikes go even higher, because what happens is that people wonder about a person, and they say, who is this person? You know, how old are they? What are their qualifications? Who are they married to? What... What are they known for? And when you do a search on the internet, oftentimes the first thing you will find is a Wikipedia page. So it's imperative that really strong, factual, highly cited Wikipedia pages exist for people to be able to find this information. And thankfully, there was one because then her page views started hitting 5,000 page views a day and on and on. Um, uh, last time I checked this morning, uh, looks like she's starting to hit 9,000 page views a day. This is a woman that was hitting 20 and 30 page views a day only a couple years ago. But because of TikTok and the attention she's getting there, her views have just skyrocketed. Now, one of the things we noticed recently is a doctor on TikTok has taken to making short videos that are focusing on different aspects of the medical health industry and also pseudoscience. And this doctor has 1.7 million followers on TikTok. And we just noticed that when he's doing his little video, what he's doing is he's putting up the Wikipedia page as his background And he's reading off the Wikipedia page, the very words that my GSOW Wikipedia team had written back in 2019 in a way to inform the public. So we're not sure if the reason her Wikipedia page stats are starting to hit 9,000 page views a day is because of this doctor and possibly other people on TikTok and YouTube or wherever who are talking about her critically. And people are saying, hmm, that's interesting. I think I'll check her out and find out who she is. Or if Barbara O'Neill's own TikTok world, her accounts, and also other avenues she may be trying to get her misinformation out there are fueling this. It's probably a little bit of both. She's got renewed interest in her. And this 9,000 page views a day, we're not sure if that's the new normal or if this is going to be the beginning of the end, because right now it's it's just a spike and we haven't had enough days to see if it's going to trend for a long time. But for whatever reason, I want you guys to know how important the skeptic zone and the Australian skeptics community was, even if they didn't think they would have a large audience to write and report on this naturopath, because it brought to my attention how important she was and that she might someday have a following And we wouldn't be aware of it. We wanted to make sure that people would have some nice place that they'd be able to find some information. We had no idea that she was going to hit this kind of views. She's our number one viewed Wikipedia page. Out of all the 2,160 Wikipedia pages we've written, right now she's trending as number one in views. Since we wrote her Wikipedia page in English and Spanish combined, there's over 500,000 Wikipedia hits. And this doctor that we saw on TikTok, his video that he released in April has over 500,000 views. 
So we are creating content for people to find information, good quality information. And then the media and influencers are taking that information, the very words my team has written, and then they're just pushing it out there further and they're educating so many more people. So if this is something that you would like to do, please join us. We badly need editors. There is so much misinformation on Wikipedia. There are so many people that still lack Wikipedia pages that should have them. There are so many Wikipedia pages that need better citations and photographs on them. It's imperative that we take care of this problem. And I really do need your help. Friend me on Facebook. Send me a private message to Susan Gerbic. I need your email and your Wikipedia username. I will send you a pre-training exercise that takes two hours to complete. And if you're finished with that, you will have a taste of what our training is like. And you can make the decision if you want to join my secret cabal located on Facebook. You train at your own rate. It takes anywhere from two to four months to train. You will be put in the secret cabal with your peers, and you will meet people from all over the world who are doing the same as you. This is powerful. And I want to thank the Australian skeptic community for pointing this woman out to us. You guys are phenomenal. We appreciate you. And I really do need to have more editors. So come join us. Thank you. It feels like every family has one. You can summon aliens with your mind. The only reason why we can't see them is because we're impure and they're pure. They might be your parents, your siblings, your cousins and your friends. Look, she believes that lizard people are walking on the face of the earth. They might be your teachers, your police officers and your lawyers. It's just like, if you disagree with us, there are going to be severe consequences. They could even be your elected representatives. Everyone is out to get you. Everyone with the PhD and MD, everyone in the government is out to get you personally. We watched them storm the capital of the United States. I mean, if I'd have told you on January 5th that any group of people would try to overthrow the U.S. government, you said, no, of course not. We saw them occupy Ottawa. Scientific proof that racism doesn't exist. Their sources are always, trust me, bro. But what no one is talking about is how they're destroying relationships. I don't think people realize how damaging it is to families. They are QAnon, and these are the stories of the people who love them. Like, if I play into their fantasies, I can make them believe anything I want. Look for the Q-Dropped podcast on your favorite podcast platform, including YouTube, or go to porthosmedia.net slash Q-Dropped. This is Adrian Hill from Skookum Studios in Calgary, Canada, here to read the highlights from the Australian Skeptics Newsletter. But let's hope my dog doesn't cause a kerfuffle while I'm recording. This is newsletter number 175. You can subscribe to this newsletter and get it delivered to your inbox every other week, complete with links to all the stories. Just visit www.skeptics.com.au. But now, let's see what Tim Mendham has for us this week. Hi all, says Tim. Plans for Skepticon 2023 in Melbourne, December 2nd through 3rd, are coming along. International speakers announced are Susan Gerbic and Melanie Trasick king two of my favorite people, with more details and tickets to be announced soon. Meanwhile, above and beyond this newsletter, you can find more in-depth stories, the weird and the wonderful and the worrisome, on our Facebook page. Read on, Tim. Okay, Tim, I'll do just that. Can garlic really cure COVID? An Australian company has been promoting garlic as a cure for COVID-19. 
This article gives a good overview of the issues, especially the Doherty Institute, which was involved in research, hoping to clear up some confusion. But the confusion was not helped by an institute researcher quoted elsewhere as saying, quote, garlic is known to be good for killing bacteria. It's long been used in traditional Chinese medicine, end quote. Well, the problem with that is, of course, COVID and influenza are viruses, not bacteria. And traditional Chinese medicine is, well, traditional Chinese medicine. GP in defamation battle gets pre-trial lift. A Supreme Court judge has rejected most claims in a defamation case against Melbourne GP Dr. Adam Smith for YouTube videos he made challenging the evidence behind products sold by a US-based naturopath. In a pretrial judgment following a March hearing, Justice John Dixon considered 96 questions for preliminary determination relating to 10 videos. He rejected a large number of the claims made by Dr. Farah Arsenia Augustine Bunch, saying that most imputations in the videos are expressions of opinion. Dr. Smith has welcomed the rejection, but says his life remains largely on hold. India cuts periodic table and evolution from school textbooks. Authorities say it is because some topics are too complex for students at certain levels, and that there are overlaps with other courses. As a teacher, of course some things can be too complex for students, but I don't think that what they're talking about is. But it has been commented that, quote, there is a movement away from rational thinking against enlightenment and Western ideas, end quote, in India. It's sad that it's affecting education. UFOs number one. NASA talks UFOs ahead of final reports. Following the announcements by the U.S. Pentagon over the last few years that there really were such things as unidentified aerial phenomena, in that they are unidentified and should not be assumed to represent alien intelligence, NASA held a public meeting earlier this month on the same topic, a year after launching its own study into unexplained sightings. They examined around 800 reports of unidentified flying objects collected over decades, but only a small fraction, 2% to 5%, were truly unexplained, they said. UFOs number two. What's up with those claims the U.S. has recovered UFOs? A long take on the latest claims by David Grush, who has noted credentials within government investigation circles. His statements that the U.S. government has aliens and crafts stashed away have received a lot of coverage. This article is one of the best summaries. It will take a while to read, but it's worth it. Meanwhile, Stephen Greenstreet, an investigator we referred to last newsletter with his investigation of the Skinwalker Ranch, has his new take on issues with Grush's claims. And more meanwhile, a debate between noted UFO skeptical investigator Mick West and Australian journalist Ross Coulthard, and a couple of others, is well worth a look. Coulthard, a former Walkley Award winner, has been a longtime promoter of UFOs, and it was his interview with Grush that set off the current flurry of interest. UFOs number three. Does the U.S. government want you to believe in UFOs? This story moves from one self-professed UFO whistleblower, Bob Lazar, who had fraudulent credentials, to the latest version, David Grush, who does have credentials, but does that make him any more right? The author suggests, quote, there is clearly now a faction within the national security complex that wants Americans to think there might be alien spacecraft to give these stories credence rather than dismissal, end quote. I wonder if the government keeps these UFOs in parkades. Hypnosis, science or pseudoscience? This is a short article with a bet each way. Yes, a lot of pseudoscience about hypnosis, but some benefit, but not a panacea. Still, it's an interesting summary, and it is short. 
the white lie at the heart of vaccine history. No, not that vaccines don't work. They do. This long article is about the history of the development of vaccines and how it might not be as we have normally heard it. Quote, a milkmaid did play a role in how vaccines were born, but it's not how you remember it. The story that Dr. Edward Jenner realized that milkmaids were immune to smallpox because of their exposure to cowpox was a lie made up by his biographer to rehabilitate his image, end quote. Update, Skepticon 2023. Skepticon International Speakers. The Victorian skeptics have announced two keynote speakers for Skepticon 2023. Two wonderful people, in my opinion. Long-time skeptical activist, Wikipediatrician, and investigator of grief vampires, Susan Gerbeck, a favorite with Australian audiences, will be coming here. She will be joined by Melanie Trussett King, creator of Thinking Is Power, an online resource that provides accessible critical thinking content. And check out her website, she's got some awesome t-shirts. Skepticon 2023, the 39th in the continuous series of Australian Skeptics Annual National Conventions, will be held on December 2nd through 3rd at the Brain Centre, University of Melbourne, Parkville. Psycon 2023, October 26th through 29th, Las Vegas. And this one I'm going to. Psycon 2023, presented by Skeptical Inquirer magazine and the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry, will be held from October 26th through 29th at the Flamingo Las Vegas Hotel and Casino. The amazing speakers will include Richard Dawkins, Penn and Teller, Richard Wiseman, George Robb, Kenny Biddle, Mick West, Naomi Oreskes, Eugenie Scott, and Paul Offit. An amazing lineup. The June issue of The Skeptic Magazine is now out. Digital subscribers will already have received their copies. Hard copies are currently at the printer, and subscribers will receive their copies in the mail soon. The issue contains an in-depth look at the legal and financial goings-on of the anti-vaccination movement. It also has articles on Eastern versus Western medicine, the truth behind the Illuminati, and lie detectors. And that's two separate pieces, not that the Illuminati would ever lie. The history of racing driver Peter Brock's infamous polarizer, and much more, including a report on the latest claims of the NDIS founding psychics. Items of interest. New documentary on anti-science, Satanic Panic. The movie Died Suddenly claimed that COVID vaccines were killing everyone, all built on totally shonky evidence. Its spiritual sequence, End Days, imagines the virus itself as an artificial bioweapon in the, quote, God versus Satan end times narrative, end quote. Hmm, sounds like fun. <laughs> Top 15 best movies about demons of all time. This list goes back as far as one of my favorites, Rosemary's Baby from 1968. But like a lot of these of all time lists, the author has a narrow frame of interests, i.e. the last 20 years. So no Haxon, 1922, Night of the Demon, 1955, scary until you see the demon, The Haunting, 1963, though this is more ghosts than demons, The Devil Rides Out, 1968, or a gazillion Hammer films. Is this paranormal ghost footage real? As you can probably guess, probably not. A rapid fire collection of videos of ghosts and poltergeist activity. It's only one and a half minutes, so don't blink. And some of the clips are blatant and poorly done hoaxes. And others are more fun. We include this here only because it gives a taste of the sort of stories we get at Skeptic Central every day. And it will save you lots of time following up on each one as we do on your behalf. Thank you. Silly story of the week. I timed my pregnancies so my four children have compatible star signs. <laughs> so much for the spontaneous romantic moments. <laughs> Psychic Inval Honigman from Yorkshire has told how she is able to look into the future using tarot cards and planned the births of her children to have compatible zodiac signs. 
And when her first child was due, she even arranged to have the baby induced on a day she would be a Pisces rather than Aries. Oh dear. It means that three of her four children are Pisces, as well as herself and her husband. Hopefully that fourth kid is not doomed to spend the rest of their life being incompatible, or worse, Scorpio. Well, that's all for the newsletter, which means it's time to talk about the Canadian word of the week, which is parkade, P-A-R-K-A-D-E. According to Dictionary.com, it is a uniquely Canadian word that the Etymology Dictionary online had zero results for. And Microsoft Word doesn't like it much and keeps underlining it in red and wanting to change it to parade. A parkade is a building or other construction designed for the parking of motor vehicles, or maybe even UFOs. When Richard was visiting here, we went out for dinner downtown and drove into the Palliser Parkade. And he thought it was a business name. He did not realize that a parkade is where you park. But ChatGPT knows what it is. Quote, I once saw a moose trying to park in a Canadian parkade. And let me tell you, it was a moose steak of epic proportions, end quote. Sorry about that. <laughs> I know, groan. Until the next kerfuffle, this is Adrian Hill signing off. Hallo an alle Zuhörer aus Deutschland und natürlich alle Zuhörer aus aller Welt, die Deutsch sprechen. Obwohl dieser Podcast Englisch ist, hoffe ich, dass ihr trotzdem Freude daran habt, die Interviews und Meldungen anzuhören. Ihr könnt mehr über diesen Podcast auf www.skepticzone.tv erfahren. again to look into those pages at trove at trove.nla.gov.au, the online resource from the Australian Government and the National Library of Australia, where we find those digital delights, those digital delectable delights of more words starting with D for information from the past when it comes to archived newspapers. Delicious, delectable, delicatessen. Desirable. I think you get the idea. And I thought this week would go back to an oldie, but a goodie, and one that just does not go away decade after decade after century after millennia. Water divining. Now, water divining is what brought James Randi to Australia in 1980 to conduct a series of very famous water divining tests available on, uh, on YouTube. James Randi in Australia. If you haven't seen that, it's a classic. And this week, I will have the assistance of reporter Adrian Hill, all the way from Skookum Studios in Calgary, to read one of the reports. But we'll kick off. We'll kick off from the year 1933, on the 22nd of December, in the Areas Express. And this was a newspaper from South Australia. And it says, from Sydney University Science Journal, by S. Warren Carey, The divining rod. The divining rod has, in the minds of many, long been relegated to the realm of ridicule. However, widespread use and the firm belief in the powers of the rod in many districts of New South Wales warrant the airing of some salient facts of the practice. The most popularly used in this country is the forked rod, shaped like the letter Y, willow being the most common wood in use. Other types include similar forks made from fencing wire and simple straight rods or lengths of wire. The elaborate devices once used seem now to have disappeared. I wonder what they were. With the forked 
types, the arms of the rod are held firmly in the hands, palms downward, the ends being bent around until they almost close the loop. The butt of the fork is canted upwards in vertical or inclined direction. Thus armed, the diviner marches ceremoniously over the field, the location of water being indicated by a dipping of the rod. The most common use of the rod are the detection of underground water supplies and for the revealing of ore bodies and of coal. In the American oil fields late last century, oil was commonly added to the list. If we trace the ancestry of the divining rod back a little further, we find that murderers, thieves and other criminals were detected by its agency. In fact, in France in the 17th century, if two neighbouring farmers quarrelled over the position of their boundary, the dispute would have been settled without appeal by a diviner. To see these diviners at work, it is at first very convincing. I have seen the bark ripped from the rod as the holder tried to resist its motion, and three-quarters of an inch of green stick sheared off completely. The broken ends leaving deep impressions in the operator's hands. Moreover, the integrity and undoubted honesty of many of the diviners, coupled with their own firm belief in the powers of the rod, carry conviction. What, then, is the origin of these phenomena? Early in the story, the motions of the stick were attributed to satanic agencies— but as knowledge began to advance, other causes were looked for, such as the affinity of the rod for water. Later diviners ascribed their powers to a personal divine gift, and thus the practice became surrounded by all sorts of religious rites and ceremonies. In 1853, M. Cheverell was appointed by the Academy of Sciences to examine the use of divining rods and kindred phenomena. In his report, he ascribes the movement of the rod, apart from deliberate deception, to minute, unconscious muscular movements, unconscious decision, or expectation of the operator. Now, I'll just pause and say that's the conclusion that uh, skeptics reached some time ago, otherwise known as the idiomotor action. We read on. An impression that the rod will dip at a certain point or a wish, or even a fear that it may do so, are all effective causes of this particular muscular movement. But even Chevrel has not completely solved the problem. Consider the case of a man with an open mind, who tries the rod to see if it will work for him. He goes near a well with a proved supply, holds the rod in the prescribed manner, and walks restrainedly towards the water. The rod, because of the unstable position in which it is held, will oscillate as he walks. Eventually, it will dip more than usual. And knowing that the displacement was caused by his walking, he will try to restore the rod by twisting the ends. To his amazement, he finds that the more he twists, the further the rod bends down. Moreover, if he is very determined in his efforts, he may see the bark strip off or the rod break in his hands. Henceforth, the man is an ardent supporter of divining. Yet, if he only knew it, it was his own resistance that sent the stick down. For if one examines the distribution of forces within the stick, it will be seen that the torsions, which might be expected to restore the displacement, result owing to the torsional elasticity of the stick, in two couples at the butt of the stick. I hope you're following along. These are resolved into two equal and opposite forces tending to break the stick at the butt, together with a couple which displaces the stick downwards. Therein lies the secret of the divining rod. Now I think this writer is more or less on the right path, although a little wordy in the explanation. But how is it that some diviners are so successful? Are these merely chance shots which happen to come right? In reply to these questions, it must be pointed out that the successes of diviners are always magnified, 
and their failures forgotten by those who believe in them. But even granting this, it must be conceded that diviners do meet with a measure of success. Once again, this writer has hit on something that we've known for a long time, basically magnifying the successes and forgetting the misses or the failures. We read on. In this, explained by the fact that a man with a considerable experience in well-sinking and bore selection learns to recognize the signs of vegetation, rock structure, and topography, which in his region are associated with productive wells, at least subconsciously. He recognizes the association of signs in the new locality, and it affects his judgment. One professional water borer confessed that his divining rod was merely a piece of business propaganda, his choice of sight being determined by his knowledge of productive areas. By far the most convincing, however, is the water seeker, who firmly believes that his success is due to the divining rod and who has an established reputation for honesty. He, of course, can have no knowledge of the effect of his subconscious judgment on his divining. And what an insightful piece all the way back there in 1933, and originally from the Sydney University Science Journal by S. Warren Carey. And now we'll hear from Adrian Hill. So this next article is from the Noosa Advocate and Corora Advertiser, dated Wednesday, January 18th, 1933. And the title of the article is Woman Water Diviner Regarded as a Witch. And as a note, because of the age of this article, 1933, it's using Indian versus today's term, which would be Indigenous or First Nations people. Remarkable success has been achieved by an English woman, Miss Evelyn Penrose, who was appointed by the government of British Columbia last year as official water diviner. Throughout the dry belt of the province, she has brought incalculable benefits to settlers, ranchers, and orchardists by her achievements. In one case, she found water at a moderate depth that gave a supply of 300,000 gallons a day. Facing a good deal of ridicule at the outset, Miss Penrose now smiles grimly as she sees hundreds of applications reach her from farmers pleading for her services. In some interesting observations of her connection with the art of water divining, Miss Penrose says the aptitude descends from father to daughter or from mother to son. Huh, interesting. I wonder how she figured that out. Her father and his forebears were water diviners in Cornwall. Until recently, she says she used the old-fashioned hazel or willow-forked rod, shaped like the letter Y, as she had seen her father do. When she is over an underground running stream, still water does not make the rod function. It will turn in her hands with such violence that it blisters them and takes the skin off. One day, says Miss Penrose, she discovered that she could sense the direction of water from the air at a considerable distance up to a mile. Then, by using a twisted wire rod, she not only saved her hands, but could go straight to the strongest water source. This enabled her to work faster, where hitherto she was able to do in a day but one homestead of 160 acres, now she was able to do several. Scientific Explanation Miss Penrose has a scientific explanation of water divining. It is not supernatural, but follows natural law, she says. Water, oil, and minerals give off electromagnetic waves, and fields of force and water diviners are merely human radio sets tuned in to these wavelengths and can pick them up. This, she says, destroys the romance and mystery of her art. An Indian farmer in the north, hearing that Miss Penrose was in the district, asked her if she would locate a supply of water on his property, where there were already three small springs in dense undergrowth. She gave him a demonstration that caused the Indians to regard her as a witch. 
Although some distance from the Indian's property, she spun her wire rod in her hands and the point was immediately drawn to the strongest spring, like a needle to a magnet. When they reached the property, word had passed from mouth to mouth among the Indian's family, and they would not go near Miss Penrose, but peeped at her from behind cabins or in the bush. Miss Penrose claims that she can sense oil ten miles away. Her first indication that she is approaching oil-bearing land is a violent stab through the soles of her feet. When she arrived at the strongest dome on the oil field of the Peace River, she collapsed and was unable to open her left hand or straighten her left side for some minutes. She required ten hours sleep that night to restore her physical faculties. (laughs) Oh, I guess that's what she gets for coming to Alberta. If she stayed here, she must have been in a lot of pain all the time. And now we turn to the pages of the Australian Women's Weekly, dated the 2nd of September 1981, a full year and a bit since the famous 1980 water-divining tests of James Randi and Dick Smith, which were televised also in 1980. And this is a story by Keith Finlay. Is finding water a divine art? You can do it. I saw you, said Alf Collier, 42, water diviner and bore driller of Sussex Inlet, New South Wales. I gripped the forked branch in my hands and walked forward slowly. Nothing happened. When Alf did it, the tree branch slowly swung down until it pointed towards a spot where Alf would be positioning his $500,000 drilling rig truck and bore for water. I used water divining like good fishermen pick a spot to cast. He said, I find it in the spots I know it must be. Alf Collier's primary reconnoitering equipment is a simple and cheap forked branch from a young tree or a meter-long piece of wire. This is in dramatic contrast to his 12-meter-long truck with its 13-meter-high drilling tower that can pierce the earth at 50 meters an hour. Alf swears that there is a weight pulling down on his branch. I am not a magician. I can't get water every time I divine, said Alf. I have about 98% success. Back in Sydney, there were chuckles from John Mills, Executive Secretary of the National Water Wells Association of Australia. Alf's a good driller, he said. But water divining is only useful as a sales aid. It is impossible to drill a dry hole. On the east coast of Australia, there is always water at water table level, about 40 metres down. So water divining seems to work well. And finally, we'll look in the same magazine, but ten years before. So this is the Australian Women's Weekly, dated the 17th of March, 1971. Water divining, said to be just intelligent guesswork. The ancient profession of water divining has probably caused more arguments than anything else among the people in communities where discovery and conservation of water is a matter of vital importance. Half the world believes that water diviners have a special knack. The other half believes them fools, even if well-meaning and sincere ones. On the principle that, quote, there must be more things in heaven and earth, end quote, I've always more than half believed in water divining. I saw a water diviner at work in a country area when I was in my teens. He used a piece of fencing wire bent into a half circle. He vetoed the farmer's number one choice of a place for sinking a well because he said there was no trace of water there. He approved the number two and number three positions and the wire moved in his hands like a live thing as he walked back and forward across these areas. Wells were dug in the number two and number three positions and there was water there. Nobody bothered to dig at the number one spot, so whether he was right about that, I'll never know. Now the Institute for Industrial Research and Standards in Dublin has made some tests that were reported in the science journal Nature, and they've come up with the conviction that the jerking of the water divining rod in the diviner's hands 
is no surer way of finding water than by making an intelligent guess. And apparently, I really do believe in water divining because immediately I want to say, So what? Whoever thought it was anything else? Aren't people who say we have an instinct for certain things often making very intelligent guesses and backing them up with long observation and experience? I never supposed the instinct was in the rod which turned itself down, in spite of the diviner's effort to keep it steady, any more than I thought the musicianship was in the conductor's baton. In these Dublin tests, an experienced diviner tried, at a school of military engineering, to tell whether water was running in a pipe under a lawn as a stopcock was turned on and off. He was right 25 times out of 50. A proportion of wrong to right answers that could have been got by intelligent guessing. Well, I don't know. It's not going to stop people arguing and it's not going to stop the great corporations that use diviners to tell them where the long buried water piping is on reconstruction jobs. So there we go from the Australian Women's Weekly way back in 1971. And it might be interesting to see if I can research those Dublin tests. Well, there you go, looking at an oldie but a goodie, water divining. And thanks to Adrian Hill again this week. And some of the most fascinating times I've spent in the... um, in the pursuit of sceptical interests have been on water divining tests, watching water diviners run up and down trying to find their prize. And if you Google the Mighty Mitter Muster Water Divining Test, you can see a documentary I made, well, over 20 years ago. And of course, as we always say, when you visit Trove, you never know what you might find. Thank you for listening to the Skeptic Zone podcast. And once again, a sad time, a sad time at the Skeptic Zone for the loss of one of our dear friends, Dr. Siobhan O'Sullivan. But I know she would like us to continue on. Thank you once again, as ever, to those people who support the Skeptic Zone at PayPal or Patreon at skepticzone.tv. Your contributions mean the show can keep going. But for this week, this is Richard Saunders signing off from Sydney, Australia. You've been listening to the Skeptic Zone podcast. Please visit our website at www.skepticzone.tv for show notes, contacts, and to access the back catalogue of episodes going back to 2008. You can follow the Skeptic Zone podcast on Twitter at Skeptic Zone, visit our Facebook page, or leave a review on iTunes. You can also support the Skeptic Zone via Patreon or PayPal. The Skeptic Zone podcast is an independent production. The views and opinions expressed on the Skeptic Zone are not necessarily those of Australian skeptics or any other skeptical organization. Skeptic Zone.